People may assume that forensic science is always reliable, but the process of collecting and analysing evidence is not immune to problems like contamination, faulty testing equipment or human error. Let's take a look at a case that perfectly demonstrates the fallibility of forensic science. On April the 25th, 2007, two police officers were randomly attacked while having lunch in their patrol car in the town of Heilbronn, Germany. One of the officers, 22-year-old Michelle Kieswetter, died at the scene from gunshot wounds. Her colleague was shot in the head and would be in a coma for three weeks, but luckily would survive. However, he had no memory of what had happened to them. The local community were outraged that this could have happened and demanded answers from the authorities. But investigators were stumped, and with some witnesses describing the attacker as a woman and others identifying a male as being responsible, the police weren't sure where to start. After the crime scene was processed, the police were able to identify microscopic traces of an unknown DNA sample on both the back seat and the dashboard of the vehicle. This was basically the only evidence that was found at the crime scene. The otherwise lack of evidence and the mystery surrounding the crime led to the local media to refer to the killer as the Phantom of Heilbronn. But once the DNA was run through the German Central Criminal Database, investigators realised that the same DNA sample was from an unidentified female and had been found at multiple crime scenes across Germany, starting with a murder over a decade and a half prior. It all began in a town called Ida Obenstein in 1993, when neighbours of 62-year-old Lieselette Schlenger, known as Lottie, grew concerned that they hadn't seen her in a while. When police arrived at her home, they found her dead. She had been strangled using a piece of wire taken from a bouquet of flowers that were found next to the body. There was very little evidence for investigators to use, especially since no one had seen or heard anything suspicious coming from Lottie's home. However, on the rim of a brightly coloured teacup found close to the body, police were able to identify trace evidence from the unknown female. As the case quickly grew cold, the investigators' only hope to solve the murder was through identifying the DNA sample. Eight years after Lottie's murder, in 2001, a 61-year-old antiques dealer was found dead in Freiburg, a town in the southwest of Germany. Once again, the victim had been strangled, and traces of the same female DNA was located at the crime scene. This was just the most recent incident in a growing list of crimes which had been attributed to the woman without a face by the German media. Just five months after this second murder, a distraught mother handed police a heroin syringe that her seven-year-old son had unknowingly stepped on while in a playground in the town of Gerolstein, close to the German border with Belgium. The police were shocked when they found the same unknown female DNA on the discarded needle, as had been at the two murder scenes. The police hypothesised that the woman was a drug user and was committing these crimes in order to support her habit. So, in 2007, when the police were investigating the murder of police officer Michelle Kieswetter, they realised the solid connection to the other murders was the still unidentified female DNA. When they realised this, they began a thorough search of nearly half a million DNA samples within their databases. The German Federal Police, known as the BKA, soon realised that the same DNA had been detected at even more crime scenes than they had first thought, increasing their urgency to identify and capture the woman without a face. These crimes were not only murders, but included multiple burglaries, stolen cars and robberies in and around Germany and Austria in the early 2000s. One of these crimes occurred in May of 2005, when a man shot his brother with a pistol and was later arrested by authorities. When forensic testing was conducted on the weapon that was found in his possession, traces of the unknown female's DNA was located on one of the bullets. And then in 2006, 
Authorities in the French region of Besançon alerted German authorities that they had located the same female DNA on a toy gun that had been used in a local armed robbery. German investigators were truly baffled about who this woman could be and how she managed to travel around committing crimes without being seen or leaving any other trail. Interestingly, some of the crime scenes did contain genetic prints and DNA from other individuals whom the police assumed were accomplices of the unknown female. But the same accomplice never showed up in more than one crime scene, and there was no clear pattern to the accomplices she would work with. In fact, a few people were arrested and charged with some of these crimes, but they never once mentioned anything about having a mysterious female accomplice. This led to the police suspecting the mysterious criminal could in fact be a male, and in 2008 they released a photo fit picture to the public in hopes that it would help identify the killer. But this didn't produce any leads. The police had devoted more than 16,000 hours into the investigation, and had tested over 3,000 women who were either homeless, drug users, or had criminal records. The woman without a face eventually became one of Germany's most wanted criminals, with a 300,000 euro reward offered by police in an effort to get any information about who the woman was and where she could be hiding. It wasn't until 2009 that the police would get their next lead, Police in France had been trying for years to identify the burnt body of a man who they believed to be an asylum seeker who had been murdered in 2002. When authorities went to confirm his identity using DNA from the fingerprints on his asylum application, they were amazed and confused with what they found. The DNA from the unknown female who had been hunted by German police for over 15 years. But obviously, that was impossible. The asylum seeker was a male, and the killer was a female. They were not the same person. A second test of the asylum seeker's fingerprints found no traces of the female's DNA, leading to suspicions that perhaps the materials used in the first test had been contaminated. When German authorities investigated this possibility further, they made an embarrassing realisation. The woman without a face likely did not exist. The unknown female DNA that had been collected at over 40 crime scenes and six murders had most likely already been present on the cotton swabs used by forensic scientists when they were swabbing for evidence. So, how could this have happened? Well, the police theorised that all the swabs that had been used in this lengthy investigation had been produced at the same factory. And while the manufacturing process did involve a sterilisation procedure to kill bacteria, this did nothing to remove trace amounts of human DNA that had been unknowingly deposited by the factory workers, or in this case, one single female factory worker. Foreign DNA could have been introduced to the swabs in a few different ways. For example, human skin cells and particles of sweat or saliva would have existed in the environment wherever the employees were. Not only did this case highlight the devastating impact that crime scene contamination can have on an investigation, but it also showed the presence of cognitive bias within the police force itself. When you look at all of the crimes the Phantom of Heilbronn was supposedly responsible for, it isn't hard to notice that the crimes have very few similarities, and there is no clear pattern between them. A single perpetrator was never the most likely scenario, however, the police put too much weight on the DNA evidence. An estimated 2 million euros was spent over the course of the investigation, but, more importantly, most of the victims of these crimes were effectively denied justice because of the flawed investigation. Solving the stack of cases wrongly attributed to the woman without a face meant police would have to start back at square one. The global forensic community were determined to make sure nothing like this could happen again. 
the International Organization for Standardization released the world's first international standard on the manufacturing of forensic materials and consumables, aiming to both reduce the risk of DNA contamination and to maximize the chances of detection when it does occur. These are some of the changes that were introduced. Ethylene oxide treatment was integrated as a part of the sterilisation process. It's the only effective way of removing DNA contamination on items like cotton swabs, which it does by chemically modifying the DNA structure so that it's unable to be analysed or picked up through later DNA testing. DNA samples from all personnel who encountered the forensic consumables and are at risk of contaminating them are stored in DNA elimination databases so that they can be regularly checked and avoid being misinterpreted as the suspect's DNA. These databases would include all police personnel, forensic and lab practitioners and manufacturing staff. Police and forensic scientists across the world were eager to implement these changes, not only to help restore public confidence in forensic DNA analysis, but also as a way of avoiding the same embarrassment that the German police experienced when they were forced to publicly admit that they truly had been chasing a ghost for over 15 years. <laughs>